Welcome to Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. The only podcast where it's okay to talk in band. On this podcast, you will be able to hear conversations with some of the greatest names in wind band conducting, composing, and arranging. We'll also visit with great college, high school, middle school, and elementary band directors to get their thoughts on various aspects of being a band director. We'll have regular check-ins with instrument specialists, music dealers, and instrument repair professionals. And if that's not enough, we'll even have regular conversations with Dr. Tim, who will help keep us motivated. That's Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. And now, here's Charlie. Welcome to Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. Today is our ninth podcast, and we have three great conversations to share with you. I'll tell you a little bit about our guests in just a minute. But right now, I want to talk to you about coming to the end of your academic year. It's been a crazy one for sure. And if you're like me, you keep hoping you're going to wake up some morning and realize this has all been a bad dream. But somehow, I just don't think that's going to happen. No, for some of our students, this is going to be the end of the line. And hopefully they'll get off of our music education train and hop on the next one. Whether that's from your elementary to junior high program, junior high to high school, high school to college, or whatever is beyond college teaching, graduate school, working somewhere. And in every case, we can only hope that music will remain an important part of their lives. Whether as an active performer or a member of an audience, the best we can hope is that we made a difference and helped to connect them with this beautiful art form called music. You know, the end of the school year is always a difficult time. When we meet the students in a traditional class, They couldn't wait to get the summer vacation. And oftentimes, we couldn't wait for school to be out either. To just have a couple of days or weeks to catch our breath, to reintroduce ourselves to our families, to sleep in past 5.30 in the morning, to be a real person again. You know, the end of the normal year is a special time for our students too. It's filled with award ceremonies and spring concerts that saluted all who played a part in the band who had successes along the way, and how they gave years of their lives to be a member of that school band brigade. But this year, that doesn't look like it's going to happen. That doesn't look like it's going to happen in person. So what are you going to do? Hopefully you've given some thoughts to how you'll recognize every single member of your band for their efforts in making this crazy situation one that was fulfilling. Whether that's through a video message, an email, or a written letter, You've got to do something. Our students need to end this year with a sense of pride. Pride that they conquered their COVID-19 quarantine classes. They need to feel that they learned, that their time was worth their effort. And most importantly, they need to feel that they pleased you. Our students need to know, despite the amount of effort they put into their classes, whether it was a little or a lot, that they did not disappoint you. And they need to know that you're proud of them and that you look forward to seeing them, whether it's next year in band or at some point when they come back to visit you at your school. This is a time to strengthen those bonds that you and they worked so hard to forge. So don't wait until the last day or the last week. Start thinking now how you're going to make an end to this school year special for them. Like you... Years from now at a class reunion, or in our cases, at a state or national convention, they will, and we will hopefully look back at this time with our friends and colleagues. We'll probably toast an adult beverage and say, remember when? Well, it's time to make sure that you do your part to make sure those memories for them are good ones. On today's podcast, we have three great conversations. We begin with Robert Davis, director of bands at Olathe Northwest High School. 
Bob is an amazing teacher who may have the best rapport with his students I've ever witnessed. He's going to share some thoughts about the importance of making and keeping that connection with our students. Next, we'll visit with the Dutch composer Johan de Mai, who on May 1st celebrated 43 years as a professional musician. Johan chats about his time playing euphonium in the Amsterdam Police Band and how his award-winning composition, The Lord of the Rings, came to be. You'll also learn that Johan is a really good cook. And finally, we'll chat with Chip DiStefano, director of bands at McCracken Middle School in Skokie, Illinois. Chip is an incredible teacher with an outstanding program. And if you know Chip and listen to this conversation, you'll get some great insights as to why he is so organized and driven. Chip will share with us the four benchmarks he's established to create his outstanding program. So that's Band Talk with Charlie Mangini. We'll be right back. Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends is made possible through the support of Hal Leonard, Eastman Musical Instruments, and Vandercook College of Music. Well, joining us on Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends is the Pied Piper of Kansas. He's Robert Davis. He's the director of bands at Olathe Northwest High School. And Robert, welcome to the program. It's a real honor. Always a pleasure to talk to you. <clears throat> Bob, you're in your ninth year at Olathe Northwest High School. You've got a terrific program going. You've got four concert bands and four jazz bands and a marching band and an extracurricular program beyond uh, belief. And you've got 350 kids in the program. Uh, how are you hanging in there not seeing any of those kids during this time? Well, you know, thank goodness for Zoom and, and all the other platforms. It, it allows us to connect in some way. Uh, a lot of a lot of emails, a lot of phone calls, a lot of a lot of meetings online uh, helps us keep connected as best we can. Yeah, the last time I had a chance to see you, I uh, had the honor of uh, an invitation you extended for me to conduct the Kansas Music Educators All State Band at the end of February in Wichita. It was a great experience, and you did an absolutely marvelous job of organizing that event. And I just want to say thank you for that. Oh, I want to say thank you. Uh, that was an incredible group of students to, to watch and listen to and the leadership and the lessons you brought to them. That was a real treat. And, and it was especially great to see you back on that Kansas Music Educators Association stage. That was a lot of fun. Thank you for your time and, and your talents there. We all enjoyed it a lot. Well, it was an honor and the kids did a great job and you did a yes. great job. And I, and I wanted to say thank you. You know, while I was there, it reminded me of what strength you have that, that many, many, many people um, maybe overlook. And that is you are completely focused on making sure that students have an incredible experience. Um, one of the things that, that, of many things that I'm very, very impressed with you is that your ego is fed when you see students excelling. When you see students doing wonderful things, when they, you see them growing, you see them realizing their goals. How's that been for you during this, uh, this distance learning time? It's been really difficult, um, you know, to, but talking about what you said, it's, it's for a really selfish reason. I think a lot of the great music teachers that I had gave that gift to me, just all the investment in students and, and their experience and, and helping to foster their passion. Uh, for music and education, I, I was inordinately blessed with, with the teachers I've had the opportunity to work with, yeah, you included, and, and being able to pay that forward is, is terrific. You know, we just have to find new and creative ways to keep those connections going and, and keep finding opportunities to make sure our students stay motivated and get the tools for development they need, and it's tricky. But, you know, things like this podcast and all of the great resources that I get daily from from a lot of different vendors and and music advocacy groups uh, to my email provide so many new ideas and, and ways to connect that we'd never really I'd never really considered. And, and we make it work the best we can. You know, in addition to, to having an incredible uh, student uh, participation in your program, you also have uh, an incredible parent 
craft group, Parent Support. Yes. You, you yes, do I do. It's called a, a blues and barbecue <laughs> uh, jazz benefit. Uh, uh -huh. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Well, I, I wish I could take the credit for it. It's an incredible night, but the, the founding directors of the school put it together. And it's a, it's a silent auction, live auction, dinner dance. The, the students uh, serve a barbecue dinner to patrons of the community and families and businesses. Uh, they buy tables um, to, to enjoy our jazz bands that provide the entertainment. Uh, the students solicit um, auction items from the community and, and from companies here, there, and everywhere. And those funds then go into student accounts for travel and to help pay for lessons. And it helps keep our band fees, uh, at least for our area, very low. And, and I love that. Students, uh, students can be in band and get all of the benefits of, of a great program uh, without having to to pay a lot of money for a lot of our kids, there, there's no cost because of that that great event. And that event raises how much money? This year we we brought in about sixty thousand, and and there was about oh I'd need to look at the books ten twelve thousand dollars in costs, but we were able to direct about forty eight fifty thousand dollars to to our student accounts and and a little bit to our general fund for operating. It's fantastic. It is. It is. So with a with a group of parents, obviously, there's a lot of parent involvement to make this thing happen behind the scenes. The you know, best. Yes, I've, I've got it way better than I deserve. Oh, no, you work hard at it. But but how have you worked to keep the parents involved during this during this time? Well, we we just had our first uh, virtual board meeting. Uh, the other day, and it, they had they had some good ideas. They're trying to think of new and creative ways to to keep the students engaged. Um, over this weekend, all of my senior parents have been sending in uh, pictures of their, of their senior students from kindergarten and baby pictures for a little guess who game just to have some fun and, and recognize our seniors in any way we can. You know, that's, that's been so important to, well, to all teachers trying to give our seniors anything we can. But uh, the parents have been, have been really terrific. Um, we'll, we'll be, we'll be looking at a couple of opportunities for gatherings. They're helping me put together an alumni concert, uh, for whenever we can, so we can recognize our seniors this summer and, and find some of the former students who've graduated for kind of a band reunion. I'm looking forward to that. And the parents have, have taken the lead on that and run with it. And I'm, I'm sure excited for it. Um, yeah, they, they do a lot. That's great. You know, as we're looking at across the nation, I've, I've already seen there are, uh, there is a university in California that's already said we're going to be online totally for next year. Wow. And there is a university in Michigan which said we're going to be face to face for next year. Mm -hmm. So as a high school director and you get that kind of news, how do you start planning for fall? Oh, my goodness. Well, um, right now we're, we're moving forward like it's going to be business as usual. <laughs> And we're looking at, you know, what could happen, trying to, I know our state has, well, I won't, there's, there's all kinds of different contingencies that we're looking at. You know, what if marching band is moved to the spring? Um, what if, what if classes need to be taught um, online for a time, even in August and September? What do we do if we get to have band camp? What do we do if we don't? Um, it, yeah, there's there's all kinds of unknowns, but for right now, I'm I'm trying to be an optimist and saying that things are going to be, you know, business as usual when we when we come back together. However, uh, we've got a couple ideas for for doing some things online that we've already started to deliver instruction uh, for the students that are able to to get to it, and. I never would have thought we'd have been able to do much of anything um, in early March before all of this happened, but uh, we've been able to make the best of it as I know so many teachers have, uh, just finding new and creative ways to keep the students engaged. It's not like being in the band hall, but uh, we do all the good we can. So what are some of those ways that you've engaged your students? Well, I think the biggest way, uh, thank goodness for YouTube, 
there are so many great lessons uh, from world-class educators and performers that our students can take advantage of. Um, the, the United States Army Field Band has a wealth of resources on fundamental practice and, and guidance and counsel for, for our students to work on things specific to their instrument at home that I think sometimes in the ensemble, I don't, I don't have as much time. I don't devote as much time as I should. And being able to focus on that is, is very nice. Um, been taking advantage of students sending in recordings and, and I'll send them back a rubric and say, hey, this is great. You know, now, now take a look at this. And at the end of the week, if you can send me a new recording and let's see if you can make it better. Um, students have been working on all national honor ensemble music. I, in our school's history, I'm not sure we've ever had a student go through the audition process for that all national uh, ensemble honor. And I think we've got four this year that I've been hearing from that are, are going for that. And, and that's exciting. Um, we've something we started this week that I'd love to continue. Uh, we've been having virtual college visits. And, and the, the music educators at our universities and colleges have just been great. Uh, every day this past week, we've had a different university professor come in and and share some ideas for things students can be working on at home, sharing resources. Um, and then at the end, you know, students can't go visit uh, colleges right now to get an idea for what their future might be. And it gives them an opportunity to ask questions and to learn about different opportunities in our community and in our state and beyond, which, which has been fun. I've never done that before. And, and the, the college professors have just been great. You know, I always joke about, uh, with teachers, I, I say, you know, God, uh, I, I don't have time to do that. I don't have time to teach music. I've got yeah. a concert to get ready for. Right. Right. You know, I mean, so well, sometimes when we're face to face with with students, uh, we do. We don't have time to teach music. We don't have time to show them other resources because, by gosh, next Thursday at seven o'clock, we got a concert and we better sound good. And so let's get focused on on playing the music. But one of the benefits of this time is that. Uh, you know, it's allowed us some, some breathing room. It's taken some of the pressure off from having to perform, although we miss it. I'm sure you miss it dearly. Oh, absolutely. Yes. But it, but it has provided more opportunities for students and for teachers to explore other resources that are out there, you know? That is so maybe, true. Uh, when you come back, maybe you're going to have put together this incredible list of resources. And, and as a part of your normal teaching, maybe once a week, you're going to have a view, a recommended viewing thing that you're going to spend five minutes in class talking about, hey, you need to watch this YouTube video this week. They're going to talk about how to interpret a march, how to play a march, or how to, you know, practice at home or whatever it is. So I think there's some some uh, real positives that, that are coming out of this. I, I completely agree. And I, I never would have thought that. You're, you're right. I mean, nothing takes the place of seeing the kids face to face. And 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 being in the in the room and and hearing them grow as a group and and develop that's wonderful but there's so many there's so many things to music education that that I've been I've been able to put more focus into uh, one of the things uh, that I'm sending out to the students uh, on Monday I'm excited about is a world music lesson um, that I I've never done that in class but I I remember in undergrad I had the greatest world music teacher Dr Trilla Lyrla. And I loved going to that class and, and learning about Indonesian gamelan music and, you know, hearing the different instruments of Japan. I've got this wonderful introduction, again, thanks to YouTube, on the Japanese koto, uh, the African kalimba music. Things that, that maybe will, will hit a student, uh, get them excited about, about music that in my, my time as a teacher, I've never given any time to. And I, it, it's different. Yeah. Let's shift gears here for just a second. Sure. You, know, you got 350 students in your program. And I remember when I was with you, you talked about that that number could pop 400 uh, in the fall uh, of, 2020, of 2020. Yes. So, so recruitment is obviously a huge part of uh, sustaining your program. Uh, has, the, has the district, has your band staff, your area staff started thinking about 
how they're going to recruit kids into the program if we're still in distance learning? That's That's been a big talking point that I don't have a good answer to yet, but it's certainly something, especially I, I've got the best colleagues, our, our elementary teachers, uh, we were all on a, a conference call the other day talking about, well, how many mouthpieces can we get? I've got some engineering students that have 3D printed uh, saxophone mouthpieces and they were discussing, was well, it possible to, to 3D print a trumpet mouthpiece, a trombone mouthpiece that students could use to try and eliminate some fears of, uh, you know, what the Santa spray can't can't uh, put people's fears at ease to, you know, uh, just devi devising as many ideas as we can to make people feel safe so that we can indeed have instrument counseling uh, for the recruitment time. But there's a lot of things we've got to work out, as I know there's a lot of other people looking ahead for what we're going to do. Um, I'm sure we'll, you know, we're music teachers. We'll, we'll, we'll figure out a way to, to make it work. I, I wish I had a good answer for what we're going to do, but I'm confident we'll figure something out. Yep. We're figuring it out as we go. Yes. And I know there's nobody that's going to figure it out better than you, Robert. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm surrounded by a whole lot of really smart, enthusiastic teachers in my neighborhood. And, and uh, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to working with them to find out how we can best serve our students. He's Robert Davis. He's the Pied Piper of Kansas. <laughs> He's the director of bands at Olathe Northwest High School. Robert, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for this resource. It's It's been really terrific to get to hear and learn from teachers here, there, and everywhere in these times. I, I appreciate all your efforts. Thanks for being such a good friend of music education. You'll never meet a finer person or a more dedicated teacher than Robert Davis. Bob is one of those teachers that just never takes credit. He's always praising his students, thanking his parents, shows sincere appreciation for his colleagues. He's one of those teachers that believes in giving back and paying it forward. He reminds me of a question that Dr. Tim asks often. He says, do you remember what you were taught or how you were taught? In Bob's case, he obviously remembers how he was taught. Those teachers had a profound impact on his life, and he's hoping to do the same with his. And I think he's doing a great job. We're going to be back with Johan DeMai in just a moment. Vandercook College Music is proud to support Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and friends. Vandercook is the only college in the nation solely devoted to the practical education of the school music teacher. If you have a student who wants to teach music, or if you or someone you know is looking for a great, practical Master of Music Education program, then look no further than Vandercook College of Music in Chicago, Illinois. Vandercook also has the largest array of on-campus and online classes in their Mecca Continuing Education program. To learn more about Vandercook, visit vandercook.edu. So joining us on Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends is an international composer and a dear friend, Johan Demai. Johan, welcome. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks for having me. I, I trust that you're in New York and you're safe and sound? Yes, I'm in upstate New York, uh, as a matter of fact. I'm not in New York City. Uh, we, we have a, a small apartment in New York, but we have our main home is here in Saugerties, which is uh, the Hudson Valley, near the Catskill Mountains, near Kingston. Beautiful area. And here it's quiet. It's very isolated. And uh, I haven't left my home in a month just for groceries and that's it. So now that you're home for a while, Johan, uh, what projects are you working on? I'm actually in the middle of a new work, uh, which was commissioned by the Williamsville uh, Band Directors Boost. And it will premiere uh, next March. It's called The Painted Bird. It's uh, after a novel of Jerzy Kozinski. It's a very controversial uh, book. It's about a little boy growing up in, in uh, during the Second World War in Poland. And it's 
very cruel. There's a lot of anti-Semitism and etc. So the subtitle of my piece is, so the title is The Painted Bird and the subtitle is A Cry Against Fascism. So within this music, I try to express my, uh, my fear for fascism and, and anti-Semitism, etc. So it's a, uh, it's a little heavy on the, on, on the piece, but I think it's going to be interesting and beautiful. That's great. That's great. So Johan, if, if my memory serves me correctly, you did not set off to become a composer. Is that right? I, I started as a, as, as a magician, like almost everybody else. I started in a local band in, in Holland where I grew up and where I was born and raised. Uh, becoming a musician, a player, started me to become interested to become an arranger. That was the next step. Uh, I started to make some arrangements. And the next step was becoming a composer. And the next step was becoming a conductor. So it's all related, you know, uh, becoming an arranger and composer uh, made me go to orchestras to, to try out a new piece, et cetera. So I had to conduct them. And, then, and that's what I do uh, right now. 32 years later, uh, I'm doing a lot of conducting, writing, publishing. That also became a part of my life, to become one of the first composers who started to publish his own works in 1988, to be precise. And uh, I became a professional trombone player for all my life, but I quit when I moved to the United States in 2008. That was, I thought, a good moment to just stop playing professionally and just concentrate on writing and conducting and adjudicating and whatnot, teaching. So, so Johan, talk to us about growing up in the Netherlands and, and what made you take up the trombone? I actually started on trumpet. I was 15 years old and I, uh, I was always interested in playing a musical instrument. And it was at a, a birthday party of my sister, I remember very well, and I think it was 14 or something. And a colleague of her was visiting, you know, he was uh, came to this little birthday uh, uh, party. And he played in a local band. He was the, the principal trumpet, actually a very good player. And I expressed my, my, my wish to become, you know, to become a player. And he said, well, I have an extra trumpet, so why didn't you come by and I'll give you some lessons? And that's how it started. So half a year later, I was already able to join uh, the band uh, at age 15. And I switched to cornet. And then at the request of our conductor, I switched to trombones because we only had two trombones. We had like six or seven trombones and cornets. So uh, for balance reasons, he said, would you mind to, to, to go play trombone and play the trombones? And I said, sure. So that's why I, I changed to trombone. And that, that remained uh, my main instrument for the rest of my life. Although my first job uh, was on euphonium. I got hired as the uh, second euphonium player in the Amsterdam police band in 1977, way back then. <laughs> and, um, I, but I also played trombone there and euphonium, whatever was needed. And my military service in 1975, I started on E flat tuba because that was the only opening there was. Um, but I was uh, really wanted to join that band to do my military service playing music instead of sitting on a tank somewhere in Germany. So that's how it all started. So was so the I, Amsterdam was the Amsterdam police band a professional band? Can yes, it was, a, it was a professional group, 39 players, a very fine group. And that's why I started to make all my arrangements. And actually, uh, I was there from 1977 to 1988. And in 1984, Two, I started thinking about writing a major work for uh, Wien Orchestra, and that became Lord of the Rings. Right. So started, you, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I started sketching or thinking about it in 1982, started reading the books, and um, my first notes I jotted down with a pencil and paper, you know, there was no computer program yet. Uh, I started with the fourth movement, and it took me four years until it was premiered in the 1988 in Brussels, in Belgium. And that really 
was the start of my career as a composer. So when you, uh, when you wrote that, what was your reaction when you won the Sudler Composition Prize for that work? Well, I was quite happy with that, if you can imagine, yeah. Um, I sent it in, uh, but I, I didn't give myself any chance because I thought, you know, it's probably not contemporary enough or innovating. But I just took a chance. I sent in the, uh, the score and I then had the recording, the first recording made by the Royal Military Band. And I was, <laughs> and I was chosen out of 147 uh, submissions and I won the first prize, of course. That was fantastic. It was like winning an Oscar and that has put the piece of myself uh, on the map. And, and yeah. since that time, how many more compositions have you written, Johan? Oh, several dozens. I have five symphonies now. I have seven major solo concertos. I have some smaller works, uh, lots of arrangements. I've done stuff for brass bands, you know, uh, the fanfare band, uh, or orchestra. So I don't have an exact number, but it's my catalog with Amstel Music has 156 titles. So. So that's about it. Have you done anything for choir? Uh, not just choir. I've done uh, my last three symphonies all have uh, vocal parts. So symphony number three has a female choir. Symphony number four has a children's choir and a mezzo soprano as a soloist. And my last symphony, uh, Return to Middle Earth, which is also based on Tolkien, has a, a big uh, full choir and a soprano soloist. So, so Johan, in every creative process, mm -hmm. you know, there's a time when the artist has to put down his pen and say, that's the best I can do. So when you write a work, how often do you revisit it and maybe rewrite some sections? And then when you finally get it done, do you let it rest and revisit it before you send it off to the publisher or director? Talk about that process. Yeah. Um... Well, it, it differs with every piece. Sometimes uh, the, the piece I just wrote uh, for a, a Reed Quintet and Wind Orchestra, I didn't have to change a single thing. It was just right. I changed, uh, I found one wrong note in 26 minutes of music. And uh, so I was happy about it. The form was right, the, the, the structure was right, the, the balance was good. So. But on the other hand, for instance, with the piece I wrote for Euphonium, the UFO Concerto, I made so many changes. I, I kept changing it and switching it around, and I actually added another movement. So it all depends, you know. If um, at a certain point you should just stop and let let it as it is, and and do better in the next piece. But with today's technology, it's very easy to make changes. You know, I, I'm work now with uh, Sibelius as a notation program. And I've become quite good with it. You know, it's easy to make a change. You can even transpose and, and, and part extraction. That's all I do myself now before it goes into print. So do so, you yeah. write from the keyboard? Yeah, I'm sitting right behind it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I have a very simple setup. I have a, a, a big a Triton studio. Uh, Synthesizer and the screen and the MIDI connection and and the Sibelius and two speakers. That's all. That's all I need. And I have the same setup in the New York City in my apartments. Same keyboard, same screen. So I just when I go to the city, I just bring a CD with uh, data, and I can keep working on the same piece. And my laptop, of course, has all the Sibelius in it. So. And when you start a piece, do you kind of sketch it out? Do you have a sketch for a basic form for it? Or do you just start with a start with an idea and let it develop from there? Yeah, it, that also, I don't have a, a specific recipe. You know, it's, it's, it's different all the time. Sometimes I start, I usually start with an idea, you know, a title. Um, and then I start to think about structure. I still make sketches on paper, you know, with pencil and paper. I like that. I'm still doing it, doing it today on the painted bird. And then I uh, draw some, what I call a roadmap. It's not notes, it's just a, a structural sketch of the piece. 
you know, so I, with arrows and, and little balloons saying introduction, uh, cadenza, uh, fast, uh, you know. So it's sort of a framework of the whole piece. And then I start filling it in and make little uh, uh, sketches on my synthesizer. I can record a whole wind orchestra in it. It's all set. And um, that's what I do. But some composers have complete studios, you know, with four screens and, and all kinds of, of uh, mixers. And I just don't do that. I keep it as simple as possible. So, you know, is there anyone that you use as like a sounding board? You know, I mean, all of us, all of us artists, I mean, we're insecure people by nature. So uh, when you get started, do you have someone that kind of helps reassure that you're on the right path or do you just rely on your own intuition? No, I do. I have two two persons uh, who I show my sketches to or who I play my, uh, whatever I have, the, the complete score or cards of it. The first one is my wife, Diana. She's not a musician, but she has a very good ear and very good taste. And the other one is a friend in the Netherlands. Uh, his name is Anthony Fiamara. He's a dear friend. He's also a composer and he does the same thing with me. He's, you know, we 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 spar together. He sends his, uh, my, uh, his stuff, his latest piece, and I go through it, you know, and I say, why don't you do this, and blah, blah, blah. And he does the same with me. He, and he's very honest, you know. He says, yo, I don't think it's, it's too long, or, or it's too short here, or this transition is a little too sudden, you know. So we're, yeah, we're very, very uh, good listening partners for each other. And so is Diane, you know, if Diane says, hey, I'm getting bored. <laughs> that, means, that means too long, and, and I take her uh, her judgment very serious, you know. And and if she says, "Oh man, it's it's fantastic," just leave it as it is. It's 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 just right. Then I'll do that too. You gotta you gotta love that those other special people in our lives are so brutally honest with us, you know. Well, I like that. I like positive criticism. You know, that's I really need that as well. <laughs> Because, you know, I'm sitting here at home in my little ivory tower and um, I like it when people have comments or, or uh, suggestions, you know, I'm always welcome, uh, always open to that. I don't have long toes, if you say in Dutch. <laughs> As some composers do, you know, they don't touch my music, don't even dare to talk about it. I'm not that way. I'm very open, you know, and if something is not right, I'm the first one to change it. To make it a better piece, you know, that the... Don't be afraid to kill your darlings, said the Harry Mancini. So right. If, if something is not good, you know, just take it out or change it or, or, or delete it. And that's what happens. So other than band or orchestra music, uh, what kind of music do you listen to? I hardly listen to any kind of music, surprisingly. Uh, especially when I'm working on a new piece, I don't want to hear anything else because, you know, I'm, it's in my head and it's it's... Um, it's yeasting, so to so to speak, and then if I hear something else, you know, it's it's just it's disturbing, and then so I never only in the car, you know, I put on a radio, local radio station and I hear some classical music, but but my my musical preferences are not only classical or band music. I I love uh, folk music, classical music, uh, Bulgarian female choirs. I'm totally nuts about. Some good pop music, you know. Uh, so I, I'm an omnivore. I like all kinds of music, and everything can be inspiring. And contemporary music, you know, like like uh, contemporary uh, orchestra music or band music. I'm in, the, I'm in the jury for the uh, the ABA, the American Bandmaster Association, every year, and I really like to do that because you get to listen to 40 to 60 new works, you know, by French composers and it's really nice to to to, to keep uh, being updated what's what's written today, you know, these days. So, are are you a reader also? Do you read books? Mm, not much, not, not much. much. I'm a very slow reader. <laughs> it takes <laughs> forever. It's the language, it's book, thing, but, isn't it? But I always have when I travel. I always have a book with me, you know, in, in case there's a delay or you know, or long air air flight. So. But no, I don't read a lot now. It's just, I spend most of my days here now in my studio writing 
do a little fitness, do a little exercise, cooking, and that's it. That's great. So, Johan, if, if you wouldn't have become a musician and a conductor, what would you have done in life? What would have been your profession? Maybe a chef. Really? Was, What's your specialty? Oh, man, I, I can do anything. <laughs> I love to cook. And when I was a young boy, I always said to my mom, you know, I want to be a cook. And then on a ship, that was my, my dream as a, as a young boy when I was five, six years old. And I said, you know, when I'm, when I'm older, I'm going to be a cook on a ship and I'll go to Japan uh, and I'll come back with a vase. <laughs> That's what I said to my mom. <laughs> and actually I did. Many years later, I came back from Japan, but not as a chef, but as a conductor. which is also a chef. And I brought my mom the beautiful vase from Japan and she, she cracked up because you remember that story so well. You cooking dinner tonight? Uh, I am, yeah. What are you making? I'm making a seafood risotto. It's one, that's one of my specialties. I like Italian cuisine, you know, uh, pasta or Thai, you know, uh, Asian cuisine. I, I love everything. That sounds great. I wish I could come over and have some. <laughs> You're more than welcome. The door is always open, you know that. Well, Johan, you always you always whip up a great meal, whether it's for uh, somebody eating, which I'm sure you do, but your music is also wonderful when you uh, provide us wonderful works. And uh, your your masterpiece, The Lord of the Rings, still withstands the test of time better than uh, most pieces that we have in, uh, in our repertoire. And I so appreciate you taking some time today and being with us on the podcast. Absolutely, Charlie. It was a pleasure to talk to you. And, uh, and by the way, you know that, I see so much uh, resemblance between uh, preparing a meal or writing a piece, you know, it's all about the ingredients. Um, That's a great analogy. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, not too much pepper, a little bit of that, you know, not too much percussion. It's, <laughs> you're, you're weighing all the time. And, and when I'm in the middle of a piece and when I'm very motivated and inspired, and I make better meals somehow. I don't know why, but that's, that's a sort of a parallel that I've noticed. So it's that inspiration. It's yeah, it's all about, all about inspiration. But usually a piece doesn't start with inspiration. The inspiration with me always comes halfway or towards the end. Then things are falling into place, you know, and uh, it's very seldom that I start start a piece with inspiration. It's I usually say it's it's frustration. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's an interesting thing that that you just brought up because I, I had a conversation with Frank to Kelly a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. and he, and he said that exact same thing. He said, it's damn hard work when you first start and you got to keep at it and keep at it. But then there becomes a point in time where the composition starts giving back to you and it starts feeding you energy and it gets so much easier than to keep, keep putting notes on the page and having it make sense. Is that right? Totally right. Exactly. I would, I would say exactly the same thing. It's, it's planting a seed, you know, as, when you finally have an idea, you put it in the ground and then it comes up and it becomes a beautiful plant. And then you can tweet it, you know, or, or, or if it doesn't come out of the ground, then the idea is not good. So, but yeah, I, I totally agree with Frank. It's uh, and I think most of my friend composers have the same uh, startup problem. So it's so hard to start a new piece. You're staring at that blank page, you know, and, um, uh, it's all about get, getting great ideas. And the only way to do that is just sit down behind your piano or your keyboard and, and find stuff, find melodies, find chord progressions, find fun, fun things to work with. Yeah. You know, our, our good friend, Tim Lotzenheiser always said, uh, um, action produces motivation. You just can't wait to get motivated. You got to start doing something. And then after you do it, exactly. all of a sudden you become motivated. Dr. Tim is always right, and so is he in this case, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Well, Johan, I can't wait to see you again. I hope that uh, our paths cross sooner rather than later, my friend. Well, thank you so much, Charlie, and thank you so much for uh, doing this. You know, it's great to reach out to our, uh, our people in the world, especially right now, you know, with our isolation. But, yeah, absolutely. Um, sure we'll, uh, we'll get over this together, and and thank you again, and I will, I will keep promoting your uh, your program as much as I can. Well, thanks very much, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Okay, thank you, Charlie. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Johan Demai is a wonderful guy, and it's really great to get to know 
a little bit more about his background and what goes into his creative process. Like others, he tells you that inspiration comes after you start putting in the time. It's true in composing, it's true in performing, it's true in teaching. That inspiration comes when we put in the effort and then all of a sudden the rewards start to appear. We're going to be back with Chip Stefano in just a moment. Today's podcast is made possible through the support of Hal Leonard, publisher of the Essential Elements Method for Band and the Essential Elements Interactive website that is free for Essential Elements users. Essential Elements Interactive, or EEI, is a state-of-the-art, cloud-based support program that is constantly evolving to provide you and your students with more information and resources to help them learn and have fun while doing so. To learn more about EEI, visit EssentialElementsInteractive.com. Joining us for Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends is a young man who has established one of the premier middle school band programs, uh, not only in the Midwest, but in the nation. He is a terrific music educator and his name is Chip DeStefano. Chip, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Charlie. Happy to be here. So Chip, I, I know that you're like what, in your 23rd year at McCracken, is that correct? Uh, this is my, actually very close. I'm finishing up my 24th year. 24th year at McCracken Middle School and uh, you serve on the National Band Association Board of Directors and you've had your kids play at every state convention and regional event and all that sort of stuff. So uh, you have really reestablished one of the premier programs. Uh, uh, so how did you, how did you create such a successful culture? Well, I think a, a big part of it was I, I always preface answering a question like this by, by making sure I credit my predecessor uh, who was at McCracken for 33 years um, himself, uh, Don Stahlberg. He was a great teacher. Um, I did not have to develop any sort of culture. I didn't have to make a culture change when I was, when I started at McCracken because the kids already really cared. The community bought in. Um, there was a lot of support, uh, for the fine arts in our, in our school district already when I got there. Um, so, so my, my challenge initially, I think was really to let, you know, say, yes, everything's been going great and the programs had a lot of success but here's my vision of what I think is possible with these kids and uh, just trying to get the, the community and the kids to buy into what that vision is. Um, but to me, I, I, I ultimately kind of believe there's, there's, a, there's a handful of things that really go into creating a culture with the program. Um, first and foremost is the standards that we set, the, the standards that we set most importantly for ourselves, um, also for our kids, but mostly for ourselves, um, the repertoire that we play with the kids, um, and I think that's particularly important because repertoire, you know, quality repertoire played well is the, the single most influential factor into student motivation. Um, making sure that we plan and execute our rehearsals according to, to our, our strategy and our vision. Um, and then also just, you know, if there's a fourth thing, it's having a vision for that program and really having a sense of where you want it to head and, and, and how you want to get there. Um, and I, I think, you know, over time, some of those things have developed. I, I really came in with a lot of energy at the beginning. Um, but uh, I think ultimately those are the, the things we did to kind of create that culture. Well, you're a Northwestern boy. I mean, you studied under John Painter. Correct. And, and so where did you go to high school? So actually, my dad was in the military initially, and then he worked for a government contractor after that. So we moved around quite a bit. Um, I graduated from high school, uh, Boise, Boise, Idaho, um, Centennial High School. I think you were just out there, weren't you? I was. That's a really good. That's a really good program. It's a terrific program. This school had just opened when I got there. I think, I think when I got there halfway through my junior year, it was in its second year of being open. Um, but yes, it was a it was a uh, really, really great experience uh, at that program. Prior to that, we were in El Paso, Texas, at Hanks High School. Some good programs there as well. Yeah, it was outstanding. It was very, very good. So Chip, take us through your, your daily rehearsal. Take us through when you have your kids face to face. Uh, what, what should I expect? I come in your, your top band, what should I expect? Well, I, the first thing you're gonna see is our daily routine, which uh, it, we kind of rotate through a few things. 
um, but uh, a lot of long tones. Uh, beginning of the year, we start on concert F um, and really kind of trying to establish what we want our ensemble sound to be like. Um, as the year goes on, we'll shift off a of concert F and we'll, we'll rotate through a bunch of different keys. But we start with concert F, um, as long tone studies, Remington studies, um, lots of breathing exercises, um, a, lo a lot of corral work as well um, through the beginning of the year. Um, we rotate that through as well with uh, articulation studies um, and really focusing in on making sure the kids are articulating correctly. Um, in a variety of styles. So we, we kind of address those issues separate from the music so that when we get to the music, they're just applying what they've already learned. Um, those are probably the, the, the two big things, really kind of focusing in on our tone and pitch, um, focusing in on our articulation. Um, occasionally we'll do technique work. We should probably do a little bit more, more of that scales and stuff, but we, we really focus in on the, the tone and pitch and articulation for that daily routine. So how much time do you spend on the warm up? Uh, I think in a typical rehearsal on an average rehearsal, um, for our 33 minute rehearsals, 10 to 13 minutes we spend on the routine. For our 80 minute rehearsals, it's probably closer to 20 minutes for that routine, but it really depends on the time of year. So the beginning of the year, um, the first rehearsal especially, we might, we might spend 97% of our time on the, on the routine and trying to establish our sound and very little at all, maybe eight measures of some repertoire um, and if, uh, if we're frantically preparing, trying to get some last minute stuff towards the end of the year, um, we might, we might just do a, a real quick long tone concert app, hold it out and then go. Um, but I think on, on average, I try to keep it between 10 and 13 minutes for a typical rehearsal. So you said one rehearsal is 33 minutes and one rehearsal is 80 minutes. That's yeah. A, so that's a big discrepancy. Well, we have a really, if, if you're not from the Chicago area, it's a really weird schedule. Um, in that all of our all of our full our, all of our large ensemble rehearsals are outside of the school day, so our top band rehearses every morning, uh, seven twenty to seven fifty three, um, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, um, and then we also rehearse after school on Tuesdays from two ten to three thirty. Um, so those are those are why the the rehearsal times are different. Um, our days are spent. Uh, through class pullouts and working with the kids in smaller groups um, with, uh, with our fourth and fifth graders, you know, they're half an hour lessons for them. For our older kids, they, they, we see them for a full period, so a 42 minute period. Um, and, you know, the, those lessons kind of kind of vary depending on which group they're in. The top group is, is pretty much exclusively sectionals. We'll do some fundamental work, of course, but uh, we spend a lot of time on the band music and working on the band music in those sectionals. Our younger groups, it's almost exclusively techniques classes where they're working out of a method book um, and not working on the band music at all in those lessons. So how many kids do you have in the program right now? So right now we're just under 240 um, in grades four through eight, which is as large as it's ever been since I've, uh, since I've been teaching at McCracken. And do so you, have, on, you have help? I, I do. So we have, this is the second year now that we've had a, a second full-time band director, uh, Cesar Mendoza. We uh, got him from the University of Illinois last year. He's a terrific, terrific young teacher, full of energy, really loves the kids. We got, I, we got really lucky to stag him. Um, prior to that, the position was part-time, 0.4, um, and, and also very lucky to have for, for ten, those 10 years, David Morrison, who taught at Prospect High School for Great for the bulk of, bulk of his career, he's a terrific teacher, a, a heck of a guy, a heck of a person. Um, I learned so much from him, having him, having him work with, with us. So, so to kind of hang on to that and, and kind of shift, I mean, you got 240 kids with two directors, which is about 120 kids apiece. So, so now the band curriculum has been turned upside down with the coronavirus um, how are you approaching this time with 120 students? I mean, what kind of assignments and activities uh, do you use? Well, as, as it, it's obviously, you know, kind of tough. And, and like everybody, we're just trying to do the best we can um, to keep the kids engaged and to keep them learning and to keep them improving. Um, we, have, uh, we have fourth through eighth graders in our program. And so the needs of those kids vary greatly depending on their age and experience. So what our fourth graders need is completely different from what our eighth graders need. 
Um, so there's, there's quite a few different things to, that we're trying to tailor to the kids to, to make sure they get what they need during this time. Um, but honestly, my biggest goal for every single one of these kids is to make sure they sign up for band next year. So everything we do is centered around that, is how do we keep these kids engaged and loving music and loving bands so that we, we have them next year. Because any, anything we lose in terms of, of development, we can make up. We can, we can make up for that in future years if they're there. And if they're not there, it's gonna to be tough to, to teach them, obviously. Um, so for our oldest kids, our top band, um, the bulk of their work right now is, is actually more of an independent study where they, um, they had an initial conference with me. They filled out a proposal for an independent study about what they wanted to learn, how they were going to learn it, and how they were going to demonstrate that they learned it. Um, we'll have a midpoint conference in a couple weeks and an endpoint conference you know, sometime in May. Um, and it's been a wide variety of, of what kids have wanted to do. Quite a, quite a few kids wanted to compose. Um, some kids wanted to do research, research things on instruments or famous people on their instruments. Some kids wanted to learn a new instrument. They had a piano at home or they had a guitar at home and they wanted to learn it. Um, some kids have wanted to do their own kind of multi-track recordings um, that have been so popular um, on social media uh, around this time. It's just been a really interesting thing seeing what the kids have been interested in pursuing. Um, some kids are using it as, a, as an opportunity to, to focus on something they feel is a weakness or something that they'll really know will improve their playing. Uh, one of the, the most talented kids in our program right now is just taking herself through an ear training course she found online. Um, you know, and others, you know, a couple of flute players want to learn all their trill, trill fingerings and get better at their high notes and play with better, better vibrato. So I helped them kind of try out a, a, a way to a practice sequence and worksheets and that type of thing for them to, to work on daily for that type of stuff. Um, they are, so, so we were doing that independent study in lieu of daily practice, playing assignments or something like that. Um, they don't, they don't necessarily need those daily playing assignments. I trust that they're practicing still. Um, I don't necessarily want to listen to all those playing assignments during this time. Um, but, uh, but they do, they still have a weekly playing assignment. We're doing a chromatic scale unit. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a sequence of three worksheets that we're starting slow. And every time we go through the rotation, we're just going to bump it up 20 beats per minute and see how fast we can get it by the end of the year with each of those kids. Um, they all have honor band material to be working on. I'm not going to listen to it. I'm not going to assess it, but that it, I just handed it out earlier than I normally would. Um, so many of the kids will be preparing for that. Um, and then we don't normally do practice logs with our top group, but we're doing practice logs this year. It's an online spreadsheet where the kids are keeping track of their minutes. And we're kind of doing weekly shout outs for the kids who are practicing a lot. Um, our top three practicers, top three sections, most improved. We're just, we're just kind of, any opportunity to praise a kid for putting in the time on their instrument, we're gonna do. So that, that's what we're doing with the top kids. Um, the, the younger kids though, is, is a little bit more of a challenge to fourth and fifth graders. Um, I'm super grateful that we were able to get our beginner concert in before everything shut down. Um, it was the, the, the 11th on that Wednesday. So, we, so they did thankfully have their first concert. Um, but I think our best bet for the, the fourth and fifth graders to keep them is, is to make sure that we can get them to become as competent as we can as a musician, as competent on their instrument as, as, as we can. Um, because I think if they feel success in those two areas, they're more likely to, to sign up for next year than if they're frustrated um, with what they're learning. So we're, we're still continuing method book work with those younger students. Uh, we're managing it through smart music, um, mostly because it allows them to self-track their progress and self-track what they need to do next. And it makes it a little easier for us to track what they're doing and to, to do feedback and, and submit the, uh, reassign the, uh, the assessment if we need to. Um, but the core piece of that is, is uh, Cesar and I are making video lessons for every single one of those method book lines that they're, they're being assessed. So we have uh, the, beginning of the, the beginning of the video is just basically going through the common problems. What, what areas of this line do most kids have trouble with um, and kind of addressing that and then making practice tracks um, following that. So the, you know, we do the counting 
so they can count along with us. We do the note names so they can do the note names along with us. And then we play along. If it's a quicker line, we do it slowly. Then we ramp it up and make it faster. Just trying to sequence it very similar to what a real lesson would be like in our program, but also trying to sequence it so that if they, if they sit in front of their computer on that line and play through this entire sequence for 10 minutes, um, by the end of it, they've hopefully you know, taught themselves the line. Um, which is the biggest challenge for those younger kids. They're not quite, they're not quite fully independent learners yet on their instrument um, for good reason. Um, they have they actually, you know, our beginners have only had what three and a half months of instruction up to this point. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's very, it's, it's very challenging. Um, but, you know, we're doing what we can to, uh, to keep them moving and keep them learning. It's really a good plan, Chip. So, so when this is all over, um, anything you're going to take away that's going to make you a, a better, more complete teacher, you think? Well, I was thinking about that. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I think, you know, a couple of years from now, we'll have a better answer to that. Um, I think one of the things Cesar and I talked about a lot when we were planning this out is we wanted to make sure everything's so time consuming. Making these videos is really time consuming. Um, but if it's something we can use in the future, then it's worth doing. So like these videos, it's been a lot of time developing them and recording them and editing them, editing them and getting them up on, on YouTube for them. Um, but these are also things that we'll be able to use in, in two, three, four years down the road. We can use them for the new batch of kids um, as practice tools for those kids when they're, when they're in band. They might be wondering why I'm in my pajamas for five years from now while I'm recording the video. But other than that, um, they should be tools that we'll be able to use in our program for a long time. Well, it's also going to be good remediation for those kids that need it, as well as those kids who uh, who may be absent for some reason and they miss the lesson and they have an opportunity now to check it out. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for taking time to be with us here on Band Talk with Charlie Mingini and friends. And uh, I'm wishing you well throughout this. I know you're going to do a great job whether you're uh, 100 miles away or face to face in the room. Keep up the great work and I hope to see you soon. All right, thanks you too, Charlie. Okay, be well. Thanks, you too. Chip Stefano is a master teacher. It all starts out with a vision, doesn't it? Knowing what you want from your students and your program. I really appreciate Chip sharing the blueprint he uses at McCracken Middle School. But I think he left out one thing. I think he forgot to mention the importance the role of the teacher makes in the entire process. Yes, teachers, you're the deciding factor as to what goes on in your classroom. And don't ever forget it. That's Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and friends. Next week, we will have a conversation with the master music educator of the state of Texas, Richard Floyd. We'll also check in with Rachel Maxwell, a wonderful middle school band director at Trauber Middle School in Oswego, Illinois. And we'll have a conversation with first-year teacher Josh Breen. That's Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and friends. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening to Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and friends. If you would like to send a question to Charlie or have a comment, please send an email to bandtalkcharlie at gmail.com. We hope you will let your colleagues, students, and friends know about Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and friends. Thanks for joining us, and we look forward to being with you again soon. <laughs>